<laughs> there we go. Ah, uh, there we go. I hear myself again. We have uh, a uh, temporary sound engineer who is stepping in for battery, uh, Nicolas. Thank you, Nicolas, for being here. <laughs> to uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining to already the thirteenth tour of the tools. Tour of the tools is a series where uh, uh, me and Gauthier uh, discuss different uh, frameworks, um, platforms, whatever in the in our uh, data environment in our data uh, ecosystem. Uh, often joined by very interesting guests. Uh, as we are today, but yeah, I'll let you introduce him. Right. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, so today we're welcoming Frank. Um, so Frank originally was a Microsoft research as, as at Silicon Valley. He co-invented the differential privacy, which I'm not sure what it is, but you probably can tell us more about it. He also led the NIAD project. He holds a PhD in computer science, and he's today uh, the chief data scientist at Materialize, uh, which is the tool we will. Uh, get a demo and, and be able to ask questions on uh, today. So really happy to have you on the show, Frank. Um, Excellent. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and fill, fill in all the, all, all the questions you happen to have about differential privacy. Uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I, I think you have a few things prepared yeah. for us. Yeah, well, um, I was to say a bit about what material is it. and what I'm about to like Try to try to show off and try to get get folks excited mm -hmm. about. Um, so, uh, materialize is, is actually it's a, a pretty cool reflection of a bunch of work that that we did uh, previously at some at Microsoft Research, some uh, with uh, students at various other ETH and Zurich, um, built around a system that is really good, uh, designed to be really good at incrementally maintaining big data computations for you. Um, and at the time, that was sort of a, a cool, fun. Um, tech demo, in some sense, uh, but it was only that. And what materializes is, is, is a company that shows up and essentially is trying to figure out how do we take some of that technology, that engine, if you will, and uh, make sure it presents as something uh, delightful to use, something that uses familiar languages and idioms, um, particularly SQL, ANSI SQL is what we're looking at. There's you know, the number of people who can successfully use ANSI SQL versus the number of people who can su successfully use Rust, I guess, is what you'd have to use uh, for the engine. It, multiple orders of magnitude difference there. Uh, so, so materialize is, is very much like let's let's do the uh, the dirty work of trying to take a complicated tool, a uh, complicated engine, I guess, and have it present as something palatable and delightful, and and figure out you know, all the all the little kinks. SQL has a lot of kinks. Uh, figure out all the kinks that might get in your way as you try to take something. It's a little bit idealized. Like the engine works for sure, but it sort of it assumes. Uh, a fair bit of you, and helping to connect the dots, basically, you know, connect the wires up from the people who delighted to just type in some SQL, press enter. I mean, we'll see in, we'll see in the demo that like people, but also tools that expect to be able to speak SQL directly to a, to a database um, and uh, get results back. We'll see, we'll wire up Metabase to materialize as, as part okay. of the demo. Okay, okay. Yeah. So that's, I think that's one of these tools is actually how we got in contact because I looked up, uh, I was looking up some uh, DBT, and I think you guys have a DBT connector. Yep. I'm not wrong. Yep, yep. I think this is one of the reasons I uh, came on uh, Materialize. <laughs> yeah, the DBT connector, like it's another good example, I think, where um, like uh, DBT has been very helpful, very successful at connecting people, analytics engineers, right, who um, <clears throat> in principle could figure out how everything works, but, but really just much better served, like using a clean, Rep single representation that they can then look at. And you know, a lot of it just turns into SQL and you could go and figure out how Snowflake is gonna handle it. Mm -hmm. But your life is just a lot better if you can plop down uh, some common interface and materialize it turns out connects really nicely behind the scenes uh, to, to DBT and, and handles one of their uh, problems which is the sort of model updating problem. Right. As your data change, do you really wanna rerun everything? You can, it's kind of expensive sometimes, it's slow, um, yeah. <laughs> So it's part of the value proposition is, is kind of that that if you if we make materialize look exactly you know, look and feel let's say just like let's say Postgres something like that then you can slot it in at all these existing tools which already add a whole bunch of value on top of you know the abstraction of a database and if we just have a little switch so we can turn that says go fast or something or continually update your answers quickly uh, as the data change in a way that traditional databases uh, sort of struggle to do because they're sort of built around Query reevaluation rather than uh, maintaining stuff. Um, yeah. All right. 
interesting. Mm. So uh, I've got a few questions, but maybe uh, yeah, I level. <laughs> <laughs> how, how I understand uh, like like the value proposition of, of materialize is that you like you can create like you can materialize a real time view on your data, and your data yeah. can be s several different data sources that you combine. That's um, absolutely absolutely right. Yep. But do you do this by uh, having materialize sort of as a proxy to this data, or do you actually ingest this data to have it real time within materialize? It's a good question. So we'll see a bit of that in the demo. Um, it's, the demo isn't going to magically answer all those questions, but the um, there's a few different takes on this that you could have depending on where you're coming from. The thing that works best for me at the moment, uh, we'll, we'll try it out on you, is uh, the data sources are a lot like foreign tables in a database. Um, you can announce where they are, how to mm -hmm. get them how to essentially subscribe to changes in them okay. and pull the data in. And one of the really big uh, features of Materialize is that you can use all of its execution infrastructure without having to have a second copy of the data locally. Okay. Um, you, you might need that. Like if, you're, if your query is really complicated and really hard, we might need to keep a second copy of your data. But if you're asking let's, the simplest of things, like you're asking for the count of the records or something, we don't need a second copy of the data to maintain the count for you. We just need to know how to pull in the data and then know how to um, update the you know, the query that is, what is the count, update that as the data change. Okay, very interesting. Um, we'll see some examples. Though. Actually, there's, there's two examples of uh, sources or what, what we end up calling them. Um, there's two examples of sources uh, here and there's some others that we could try to, try to talk about. Um, material, so materialize, I guess, when you want to get data into it, it both can pull in external data from other sources, a few prescribed things that we figured out how to uh, how to connect to, and that set's going to grow with time. But um, the moment things like Kafka and Postgres and stuff like that, as well as it has its own tables internally that you can create and update yourself, and we'll take care of keeping those around for you. Cool. Very interested in the demo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. So I mean, maybe that that might be a good. Uh, it's all probably a little bit vague. Um, so. Maybe if we start with the demo, that'll be a good sort of uh, seed crystal to, to form some questions around. Uh, sure. All right, so I'm going to switch over uh, to a new screen. When I when I throw this up here, this is um, various screens that are going to show off the demo. Um, I'm not as able to see all of you, so absolutely um, say something if uh, if you've got a question and and yeah, I'll, perfect. Uh, jump around. So this is a, a demo that uh, Marta Pes put together. Um, and uh, I think it's really cool. It's sort of self-contained, and it also does a few cool, interesting things. It's sometimes a little tricky to get demos of live streaming data put together just because finding a nice, good source of live streaming data is tricky. Um, so this is pulling in some data from Twitch. Uh, the, the URL, you can totally do all of this uh, at home, too, if you'd like. Uh, you just head over to GitHub and uh, clone this repo. I, I don't recommend doing it right now just because there's some. you have to change some tokens around and, and stuff like that. But. But the idea is that we're going to go and we're ask Twitch for, we do a data poll from Twitch, which is going to pull down a bunch of information about who's watching various streams, um, counts of various streamers playing various games. And it's going to, I'll, I'll have to walk this back in a moment, but it's, it's going to be updating. It's going to sort of be streaming in. Uh, it turns out that the request from Twitch actually is more of a snapshot that they stop at some point and you have to reissue it. But uh, well, it'll, it'll look streaming for a little while and I might have to go and refresh it. Uh, if, if it stops streaming, there's some Docker stuff that we're gonna we're gonna put together um, just to sort of give a sketch here. There's some Docker stuff we're gonna we're gonna turn on, and that's all part of the uh, the demo stuff. If you want to grab this stuff like uh, yeah, a copy of Zookeeper, or Kafka, Materialize. In fact, let me just go and do this right now. So in this other window here, we can do. Uh, so there's several things we've turned on. Um, some of them, uh, yep, great. So they're all good. The MS, MZ CLI thing, we'll get back to. This is sort of the interactive CLI, and it, it makes a bit more sense to turn it on and enter it uh, rather than ask it to run, and it'll, it'll just terminate otherwise. But there's a few things going on here. Uh, we have a materialized instance. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most, most uh, relevant uh, for us. Some Kafka stuff going on, some uh, metabase stuff going on, Postgres, Zookeeper. So these are um, the Postgres, Zookeeper, Kafka stuff. These are all, in some sense, uh, optional. Depending on whatever your your infrastructural setup is, maybe you need Postgres, maybe you don't. Maybe you need Kafka, maybe you don't. You can run materials with, with none of these things if you want. Uh, if you just want to put your own data in manually, but but most people have uh, 
have their own setup that uh, is going to vary. All of, this, all of this we can find on the on your uh, GitHub page, right? Yeah, I mean, this sorry, this all of these uh, Docker containers are part of that repo, and and if you go to the Materialize web page, I mean, sort of zip over there. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can read here, including docs that will talk you through um, some operation stuff. Uh, it'll also talk you in the SQL through right. uh, the sources of data we can connect to, which will sort of, that, that mm -hmm. might be a better first place to ask, like, can I connect my, what, uh, you know, Kinesis source, for example, to, to materialize right. or something like that. All right. So, um, so we've got a bunch of con containers up here. And what I'm sort of going to do is just talk through the demo as written. So we've we've turned on the various Docker containers. Um, we need to do a few things just to make sure stuff is working out all right. So these these are some handy little commands there. They're just going to tell us that Kafka worked out all right. And to be totally honest, if Kafka hasn't worked out all right, I, I don't have a good strategy other than turn it off, turn it on again. But, um, but yeah, we can see that there's a, a Twitch streams topic that is uh, you know has been created and almost certainly going to be partially hydrated with with data that we're just going to check now. And hopefully what we're going to see here is a, once everything starts going, yeah, great, some spray of, of JSON coming through that uh, is, is our stream, essentially. This is our data that is going to be presented at us, and we're going to try to make sense of this as it comes in. Now, of course, you might not be Twitch. You might not be interested in Twitch. I don't know. But uh, you, you put your own data here, You know, yeah. events going on in your system. Users this is like topics. an example data stream, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're yeah. mocking a data stream. It's a good time. Yeah. It is. I mean, for what's worth, it is actually real, real data. Um, it actually okay. does come, uh, does yeah. come out of Twitch, and we're going to see when we go and look at it. This, you know, video games that you recognize and stuff like that. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so um, this is the setup that we need to do. Things are now set up in a in a state that we can start to go and play with them. And the way we're going to start doing this is with a CLI. So there's this. MZCLI, which is a bit like uh, PSQL, if you're familiar with that, just a, a mm -hmm. text-based text way to get into uh, into Materialize. Um, a PSQL, sorry, works as well. Uh, you can totally use that. Uh, MZCLI has a few pleasant ergonomic features, like some syntax highlighting and, and stuff like that, depending on UI. PSQL works great, though, also. So just to be sure, like, uh, why why do we have the Postgres database here? This is really uh, you, you'll see for, yeah. for Materialize. Um, we, uh, I think it's it's mostly to show off the fact that you can take data from multiple different types of data mm -hmm. sources, okay. integrate them together. So the Postgres uh, database is going to hold. I guess I guess we'll see when we get there. It's going to hold some tags about these uh, yeah. Yeah. about these topics uh, in a way that you know Church wouldn't necessarily stream out at you. So it's not changing data in that sense, but it's uh, things that maybe look a bit more like dimension tables in a, uh, a data warehouse. You know, something that you're going to use to enrich the stream. But is not itself uh, streaming in the same way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Clear. Yeah. All right. So the first thing, first thing we do is we create a, a source, and this is essentially this is like a foreign table definition. It's it's telling Materialize, uh, here's the name of a thing, and here's how you can go and find the data associated with that thing. Uh, we're call the thing Kafka Twitch in this case, and we need to tell it you know, here's here's the broker, here's the topic we're talking about, and here's how you should interpret the data that you that you see there. We're just gonna say. Treat it as bytes. We'll do the data manipulation ourselves in just a moment. Uh, we're also giving it this ups envelope upsert instruction, which is telling it um, if you see a second copy of a key, that means you overwrite the previous value, not that we have uh, uh, a second value in addition to the first. So there's, there's a whole bunch of the create source command is, is where a lot of the uh, integration Excitement comes along where where you realize like oh I need to you know I'll need to be able to change these value types to be text instead of bytes or JSON or or post, uh, you know various other um, sorts of formats uh, and the complexity more or less depends on the thing you're pointing at so sometimes it can be really easy sometimes it's it's uh, pretty complicated but let's just start with um, with that so creating a source. You might notice it's super, super easy. Actually, let me. Hopefully, this this doesn't end up embarrassing me. But uh, we'll turn, turn on the timing here. Uh, creating a source is almost a no-op. It's it does a fairly small amount of validation of the source. So it, it goes and makes sure that we uh, can find this, for example, that we won't error out when we start to use it. But we haven't actually pulled in any data yet. We've just told Materialize, 
here's when someone references Kafka Twitch, here's where you go to find that information. Clear. Perfect. So we've got a few more things to do next. Um, the data as as it's coming in are just a bunch of bytes, right? And bytes, we could look at them, but they're just they're bytes. They're not gonna make any sense. So we're gonna do something you do in a uh, database, standard database, which is create a bunch of views. Right? So a view in SQL, right, is a definition of a query mapped over some other data, some other views or sources or tables that does something. I mean, it, these are going to be pretty simple. They're just going to transform row by row the data. Uh, you can sort of see in this Twitch stream conv view that we're creating, we're just turning the data into uh, into JSON. Uh, so it was bytes. We're going to turn it into um, uh, into JSON. Uh, sorry, first, if you look at the nesting, first we're going to convert it to UTF-8 uh, text, which will produce errors if it's not formatted. Hopefully, it's not. Um, then from that UTF-8, we're going to convert it to JSON and get it ready for some, uh, well, for picking up the fields of the JSON, essentially. Right. And you know, like like the previous things, these are uh, essentially metadata operations on, on the catalog. They just write down. Uh, here's a query. No, no data has yet been processed. We'll, we'll get to that, of course, in a moment. But at the moment, we're literally just saying, you know, here's uh, here are new ways to think about the data. So new names that you can give to things that uh, are adding a little bit more value in terms of giving things meaningful names and types and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of understand, like going through this this select query. I I, I don't want to read through all of it necessarily, but you can sort of see that we're pulling out various fields, figuring out which ones of these are strings versus timestamps versus IDs, uh, stuff like that. And hopefully now anyone else who shows up who wants to use feed Twitch stream has a bit more of a pleasant time. If, if we point uh, you know, metabase at it or something like that, it can actually help you out by telling you here are the columns, here are the types. That, that type is of this thing. A, I just want to know, like, is this something you kind of always have to do? Like go, go from bytes to... Like, it it depends. Um, so. Yeah, one of the types you can have up here instead of bytes is Avro. So if your right. data happened to be Avro already, um, there's a few other things. Uh, so uh, the Kafka ecosystem has a thing called the uh, the schema registry. Mm -hmm. And this is a place where you can stash schema information, about essentially uh, you know, information about how to properly decode various mm -hmm. otherwise binary files of data that you get. And Avro comes with its own. Uh, or the schema registry at least provides yeah. some information. <laughs> okay. um, w the demo here, we're just starting from bytes because yeah. some, some people are going to have bytes. And if you, if you just got bytes, uh, you know, talking yeah. to the story of how do you, how do you fix that is, is good. This is more based on the source, like coming from yeah. Kafka. Like this is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if we would come from Postgres here, we would probably skip this yep. step. And we'll do that in, actually in just a moment. It's a great point. And, um, and, and you just mentioned the schema registry from, uh, from Kafka. Like, is this something you can connect to then? And Yep. Rapidly. Yep. Yeah. Um, the the schema registry is so there's some uh, nuance here. The schema registry is part of the confluent mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem, sort of yeah. non non free ecosystem. Um, so you can have it's not too hard to have, but you have to double check that you're supposed to have it. Uh, and but then yeah, you can just point materialize at the uh, at the schema registry and and tell it. Um, there's a little bit of information you have to tell it about what am I looking at, but the messages that are schema registry friendly will have some metadata in them saying what version of the schema should they have. And we'll do all the schema resolution and, and decoding and stuff like that for you. All right, cool. All right. So, all right, so we've done, we've done a bunch of prep work here. The prep work, you know, boilerplate that like sometimes is necessary, sometimes isn't. Uh, I do it a lot because I read CSV files in a lot. Um, you know, in that case, you're just like, yeah, too bad. You gotta, you, you gotta read a bunch of text and change it around. But. So uh, that's a Kafka source. We, have, we still haven't actually read any data yet. We've still just been describing the data. Um, let's also put together a Postgres source. So this is uh, the, the stuff you would use for a Postgres source. Postgres is a little different than Kafka in that when we point materialize at Postgres's replication log, uh, it contains lots of information, actually. So it's not just one topic, right? It contains information about all sorts of tables that uh, Postgres has. So this will actually pull down a, uh, a bunch of tables uh, we're going to eventually create multiple views. So there's uh, create views with an S rather than just create view. And this will um, create and uh, put together a whole bunch of different views for us. What's the difference between, uh, because you created, I think, a source before, and here we see a materialized source? Yeah, great point. Great point. Um, uh, so the materialized modifier can be thrown in in create source. It can be thrown in create view. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's it. 
Uh, and essentially what it says is don't just uh, do a this sort of metadata operation of writing down a view definition, actually go and pull the data. Like make a yeah. copy of this locally and, and materialize. All right. So it's the same way that uh, in like standard SQL, there's a concept of a materialized view, there, which essentially says go and actually do the query, create a, a table essentially um, mm -hmm. that's backed by the data that are the result of this this view. And the main difference in materialized, I suppose, is that all of our materialized everything's tables, views, sources are continually updating in the background, so you don't have to refresh them manually or anything like that. Okay. So I think in principle, this is I'm going off script now, but um, if we do, uh, you know, show views, we have uh, some things that we pulled in. Stream tag IDs is the one from Postgres, so we should be able to do, I believe. Um, right. So this information is all stuff that got pulled in from uh, from Postgres. Uh, the uh, the formatting is, um, you know, as, as it is, I suppose, but but. Um, this, uh, you know, the the column names up there at the top, stuff like that. So this is all Postgres helping us out and providing that that structure for us. And that also means that Materialize is now pulling Postgres for changes. So yeah, actually, as soon as we typed this first command, create Materialize source, uh, Materialize went off and got a snapshot from Postgres mm -hmm. and has been paying attention to its replication lock. Okay. Nice. So as if if we had someone else at the same time going and screwing around with. Uh, with Postgres, we would totally be able to see those changes uh, yeah. reflected here. Yeah. Uh, so we were uh, maybe it's going to come afterwards, but like we we're talking a lot about sources. Can you also write? Uh, like, can I? Can uh, I write yeah. There's. Guys? I think it's not part of. You, you cannot write these uh, sources. So this is this is an important distinction, I suppose. That um, a source of data says where to go and get the data and pull it in, and it's kind of important that if a second person goes and gets the same source, they see the same thing. Yeah. Um, what you can do, uh, if you like, is uh, create create table. Um, and foo is now a table. It's a materialized thing locally that we can do. Uh, you know, insert into. Um, I'm going to totally screw this up. But... Yeah, great. Um, and you you're now able to use. Uh, well, you've always as soon as you type create table foo, you can use foo in any of these views and queries too. The, 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 to be honest, demo wise, we haven't actually mashed anything up yet or done anything particularly mm -hmm. exciting. Um, but yeah, you can you can create these these local tables. Um, it's a little subtle because you, so you can insert into them. You can you can insert retractions of data into them. Um, Materialize is less good at doing what a standard OLTP database would do, an online transaction <laughs> processor, which is data validation. So you, you know, uh, Postgres is going to be really good at saying create table foo, a int primary key, and it's going to very quickly tell you if you were wrong if you try to insert a value twice or a key twice. Yeah. Postgres is really good about saying nope, no, nope, unacceptable. And Materialize that's not what it does. Um, you know, there's a world in which we we can make that happen, but it's not going to be the top performing way to do that type of data validation. So course, the, it's not your prime focus, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, the main idea is that this, a little bit like an, an OLAP engine or something, like an analytic processor, um, you can sort of think of this as maybe living downstream from a transactional source of truth that yeah. is you know, maintaining sense. invariance and is sort of where you actually keep the data about your customers that you really need to always make sense. And then materialize is the type of thing you would attach just downstream from that and say, like, as that information and any of this sort of exciting streaming data from other sources spill in will maintain your computation for you. So the, the OLTP engine is good for maintaining the data. One way to think about it is materialist is good for maintaining the computation, maintaining the answers to questions about your data. Cool. Um, these are great questions, though. Thanks. So, um, we, so we've defined some sources. One of them is materialized, one of them is not. Uh, but uh, the Kafka one uh, is not, but we can start asking some questions. So we can start doing things like, let's create a materialized view. Um, this is going to take our Twitch stream and just do a little bit of aggregation on it, right? And you sort of read through the query, but it's it's taking the game ID and the game name and getting um, the number of streams associated with it and the total viewer count across all of those, uh, all of those, and uh, that was. Super fast to create. Uh, materialize returning back. It doesn't mean we've actually fully hydrated the stream yet. We're just, um, uh, you know, we, we have started the process in the background though. So when you when you type to create materialize view, 
we've actually said, uh-oh, we, we better get that ready for you so that when you start asking questions, like, like so, um, we uh, were able to give you the answers back quickly. So you can sort of see now that we just did another query that says, get me the top uh, the top 10, what um, total, you know, by total of you are the top 10. Uh, uh, How can some, because you just mentioned the, uh, might not be fully iterated yet. Like, how can one know? Well, this is currently serving me the up-to-date information, or is still kind of processing. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So it's a really good question. Um, I will let me try to get back to that in a little bit. There's some information, um, some introspection stuff that Materialize uh, makes visible to you, and I've, I've got a dashboard open in a uh, okay. an, another window. Um, I would probably will not successfully nail the answer to that question because it's, it is a bit of a moving target. Um, the uh, the data we pull in from Kafka, for example, Kafka has timestamps on the messages, mm -hmm. but they don't have any particular properties. Right? Like usually, usually they go up, but someone could put negative two hundred in there or something. I, I, actually, I think they're not allowed to do that. But they could put, you know, five milliseconds after the uh, the epoch in nineteen seventy. So it's a little tricky to be clear about: Are we really showing you all the data yet? Because it's hard to pull that information out of Kafka itself. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do is tell you for each of the things that you're looking at, um, th up through what offsets in your Kafka topics, are they reflecting results? Right. Um, so it's a different notion of, of progress that still requires a, a human to sort of scratch their head a little bit and say, is that good enough for me? But um, it's sort of, it, depending on the source of data, you sort of work with what you got. And mm -hmm. in that case, that's current state of affairs. But it's a, a classic question. Yeah. Now I'm hoping, let's, let's just check it out. Um, so these these haven't been changing, and I think that's probably because uh, we fully read in the stream from the from the Twitch thing, and we can get them to change a little bit, I believe, if we. Um, I don't know I have to bail out of this just a moment. So if we take our Kafka generator, and we Docker compose restart poop. Um, this will just wander off and ask Twitch again, hey, could you give me some more data, please? And uh, unless I misunderstand things, it'll just keep appending it to the topics. Uh, so let's drop back into I lost the I lost the history. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's grab that. So these are are now changing. Good, they're different. <laughs> uh, which uh, you know is a uh, re reflecting that data are, are indeed spilling in uh, the rate at which it's spilling in. I have I have no information about like whether we're uh, uh, going at top speed or whether Twitch has gotten wise to the fact that we're pulling in data. But, um, but yeah, you can see these things um, are are changing and turn this back on. But each of these queries, oops, each of these queries are coming back. Uh, I I think you know. Oh, pretty promptly. And that's largely because rather than reread the entire stream of data each time, we've gone through and put some, you know, with your, with your the user's help at least, put in some tasteful materializations there. So this aggregation, for example, is dramatically smaller than the size of the total volume of stream data in the first place. We've you know, aggregated it down to just counts and sums for each distinct game ID and name. But that's enough information to then ask these sorts of questions about what are the top games being played at the moment? Um, or you know, here's, I guess, the second one is who's who's playing anyone anything like Doom? Which uh, the answer is yeah, some people, some people. Um, I don't know. Maybe now is not a great time to be watching Doom on on Twitch. This is actually like data from from right now. So uh, cool. uh, you know, morning time, uh, Eastern US, not probably the best time. Well, anyhow, I don't want to sound judgy, but. So, uh, so yeah, so there's some simple, I mean, this is a fairly simple aggregation query that we just we just did. It's not necessarily too hard to think about how you might hand write this yourself if you needed to. Um, part of the value here though is you don't have to, you just uh, use standard uh, standard idioms from from SQL. But let's, let's try to make it a bit more uh, interesting. This is a uh, materialized view that I should actually, I should read through first just because it's, not at all obvious what's going on here. We're, we're trying to figure out which of the streams that we've been uh, talking about just now started just within the last 15 minutes. And the query says that, though it's a little maybe surpri surprising, I think, to me, at least. If we go through, we're just selecting out, uh, you can sort of see here, 
select down a title, you know, the various things game name started at. Not in all games name. And now we have this this weird pile of of constraints here, which are saying that there's a, a timestamp. I think of this a little bit, it's very similar to, but not the same as something like now in Postgres. There's okay. the current time. Um, and we're essentially saying the current time needs to be bigger than when the game started, but not bigger than, and less than in particular, uh, 15 minutes since the game started. And this is totally a query. If you put now in there, you could totally tap that into Postgres, press enter, and you get results back that corresponded to stuff where there, the time there was within 15 minutes from whenever you pressed enter for the query. Uh, and what's sort of cool, I think, at least, is that in a stream processor, we're able to take this query and think a little harder, right? And say that this logical timestamp thing, um, we know how that's going to advance. We know how it's going to grow. So we can actually use it to drive the changes in the query, right? We know that this query will change. Like when, when a record shows up and says, I started at seven minutes ago, we can say, oh, great. Let's, let's start showing you now, but also eight minutes from now, so 15 minutes from when you started, we're going to need to retract you from the results as well. Yeah. So there's some cool stuff that we could do. You know, Of course, you know, we could put this in a table and just pull it over and over again, which is expensive, um, but we can actually use our brains a little bit and realize we know exactly what's going to happen to the results of this query as a function of the data that are present in it. So you look behind the screen to optimize a little bit how, this, uh, how you keep this... Uh up to date basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the thing that in a lot of traditional stream processors, you this is a sliding window 15 minutes wide. That's and you good. need to dive into some new syntax for a sliding window 15 minute wide. Yep. You probably have to specify how often does it step, stuff like that. And what's sort of cool, and I, I think it's really neat, is no, nah, just using standard SQL. You uh, you can express that. Um, you, know, you don't have to break out of what you've sort of grown up being trained uh, with into some new syntax. And you know, we give the guarantee that the results you'll see here are going to be as if you had typed this into Postgres, pressed enter uh, as fast as you can, you know, over and over again. Cool. So, so I got a, so we have a question. Uh, it's actually from our sound engineer, but it doesn't want okay. to speed up. Um, the so basically, like, because here like, there are some. Um, these are a bit specific, right? And specific to materialize, like the materialized view and the the MZ logical timestamp. Like these things, do you provide also syntax highlights on different like, editors or like? This is a good question. Um, I we we do in the MZ CLI tool, though it looks like not necessarily through Docker when I'm when I'm using yeah. it there. But um, so so actually, to be totally clear, like materialized view is is not a materialized specific thing. Uh, so you have materialized views in Postgres as well, right. um, yes. various other database things. Uh, so we, we've really tried to lean on that a bit. We've tried to take existing mm -hmm. idioms, keywords. Concepts essentially, and as long as we're not lying about, like you know, if, if they're actually analogous, um, we'll just we'll use the same concept. Right? Of and course, materialized view is is the concept in a database of hey, why don't you go and compute the answer? I understand that that will take some computational effort and some memory. Why don't you go and do it for me anyhow? Because it's going to be valuable. Mm -hmm. So we've sort of taken that that keyword and in materialize at least the the software change the meaning of materialized. Uh, the modifier to say compute right. and incrementally maintain. Yep. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for example, the MZ log, like, yeah. the question is just generally, like, because I assume there will be, there might be a few more of these specifics that basically because it's yeah. not offered by other systems. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, to a, I don't exactly know with MZ logical timestamp whether there's anything more special than the syntax highlighting for this is a function. Um, yeah. It's, uh, we, we have actually worked, I think, pretty hard to not introduce a lot of this stuff, so that's sort of one of one of our um, one of our goals was to have a documentation uh, section that had no didn't have a lot of sections for like here's unique to materialize the only way that you can do mm -hmm. foo is something something something. So we very much wanted to read like here's standard SQL and have a bunch of idioms essentially that show off um, how to use standard SQL to do things. And to be honest, I think we would. Uh, most of us would love to just have now there instead of MZ logical timestamp, but uh, now has some specific meanings that we didn't want to uh, okay. break essentially. Um, in particular, like if you, the rate at which your stream is flowing might be different than the rate at which a clock is moving, um, oh, yeah. you know, the, the system clock. And now is meant to be very much about what is the system time at a particular moment. And 
if your stream is a minute behind that for some reason, maybe we're slow at processing data, maybe your stream is sort of slow at providing the data. You know, we wanted to be clear about which of the two was the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a great point that like the the CLI could could do uh, a lot of work for us here to try to call out like this is a really exciting and alarming thing you're typing. I don't know, you know, this this is unique to materialize. So like visually you could be able to scan and say, this query should copy paste work in Postgres or not. And having having it called out as like no no you gotta you gotta change that to now. Yeah. So. but the question is also like for example like could you have linting or stuff like that like just to make sure that whatever you're typing there actually makes sense. Uh, That's a good point. Um, what will happen? I mean that that sounds great. Um, I uh, don't myself know the right way to go and do that or what the right <laughs> idioms are for. Um, uh, we, we've got several people on the team who use databases a lot, and they come with them um, like a lot of really good experience about how do people expect to. Uh, to interact with these things, and like a common one is in the CLI, you should have really good error messages. Like that's mm -hmm. a, uh, one of the ways. Like rather than potentially rather than linting um, this sort of thing. For example, D DBT. I think one of the things that's really cool about DBT is it actually compels you, asks you to write down your SQL queries as uh, actual files somewhere. At which point, it starts to make sense to lint them. Um, you know, for as long as a SQL query is a block of text that could be in your editor or in whatever else, uh, is a little trickier to think about. Like, well, where do we hook in and start to complain or tell people? But it's these are these are great questions for sure. One of the exciting things about Materialize, like the things we're, we're working on, like yeah, the engine works pretty well already. Um, I'm just I'm gonna say, but uh, getting people's heads to the right place to think about, well, what is it? What is it doing? Like, how can I, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I get my head with minimal, you know, without having to go read, you know, a hundred page white paper to figure out how, how a thing actually works? How do I get my head into the right space to think about? Uh, but I think there it already helps uh, a great deal that this is uh, quote unquote just SQL, right? Like yeah. it's very readable for a lot of people coming from various backgrounds. Yeah. And that's definitely something we, we've leaned into a lot there. And we feel a little bad each time. I mean, to be, to be honest, when we propose breaking that, there's a lot of pushback internally. And usually, we just don't end up breaking SQL. Like we have to yeah, uh, yeah. keep Makes that working. Sense. Yeah. Makes sense, yeah. Is there, but maybe you're going to get to it, uh, Frank. Uh, is there, a, a, does Material out of the box provide a UI where you can see like the views that you've created? or No, what I, what I will do, uh, what we've started early on was saying we should figure out how to um, present as something that, for example, Metabase can, can connect to. Mm -hmm. um, like, we're not. Uh, the people who have magical gifts for data visualization, or anything like that, or you know, I'm, I'm com very comfortable with the idea that other people are better at that, that than we are. Uh, so, metabases are sort of one example of a, of a tool that, because we, you know, mostly are PGYR compatible, um, okay. that uh, Met metabase can just sort of point at us and say, "Hooray! Here's all your tables. Great. Let's let's hey, look at some enough. visualization." I'll show that in, in just a moment. But we materialize ourselves. Uh, I would say this is not not something that we're deeply opinionated about. In fact, we'd like to be as flexible as possible there. And, and uh, does Materialize expose us a bit of the internals? Like, are there some metrics that you can see about Materialize itself that you can say, OK, absolutely, the yeah. way it should, or? or Yeah, let me, I'll just, I'll call this up really quick, but there's a. Uh... <laughs> Maybe we're ahead of schedule already. Yeah? No, that's all right. That's right. I, I'm, I'm not going to show you what's in them, but there's uh, the empty catalog, uh, namespace or schema, where we have a bunch of uh, views and sources and tables. And th these are all places where the system records and reports back uh, data about the execution that's going on in the system. So we have, for example, you know, like message counts, which is uh, reporting how much, how many of these updates are we shipping around between the different parts of data flows that we're using to track computations. Uh, lots of information about scheduling and stuff like that. And one thing that I think is really cool is that these are these all present as continually changing collections of data. So you can throw these into queries too if you want. You can build many of our views up there yeah. are just queries layered over the raw data sources that we've recorded, and we'll see in in a little bit uh, that these actually feed some visualizations that we do. So uh, yeah. we can issue queries against Materialize that pull back sort of digested, continually updating data and show them in uh, more visually appealing. Uh, forms, but you, you know you can dive in there and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, convert the whole select star from. Sorry. Yep. 
which is going to you know report all sorts of stuff about different internal uh, you know channels that we're tracking various workers like this, this multi multi threaded internally materialized so different workers will speak with each other and they'll send and receive various numbers and if any of these don't line up something exciting is gone yeah stuff like that that uh, all feeds into both performance diagnostics and correctness diagnostics and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, that, that that rat hole goes down pretty deep. So I'll, I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop there. I'm really excited about it personally. Like I really like uh, doing the performance optimizations and want to talk through people through all of those uh, tables. But uh, uh, it's maybe it's something. We, we have some tips uh, in our docs about how to do uh, performance optimization diagnostics using these these tables. Uh, and I'll uh, just call them out, I guess, and then. Uh, let us uh, explore those later, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's fine. <laughs> it's just <laughs> to know. No, no, no. It's, yeah, it's a great question. And uh, uh, I'm just going off off message, I think, if I uh, express materialize as a great way to look at materialize and <laughs> figure out what it's doing. But but it is great for that. Yeah. And uh, all right. I'm going to grab this this thing. Um, this is actually, this is the one query that uh, uh, starts to get funny if I don't restart the data. So I want to make sure uh, that I, I put it in here at some point. And the main problem here is that because we're just pulling down uh, an extract from Twitch at some point in time, if 15 minutes have gone on since that point in time, this will now be empty and yeah. super boring. So actually, let's, let's see if it's, uh, if it's empty and super boring. Oh, it's, not, it's not empty and super boring yet. Uh, we've got some. You know, actual actual times in there. Hopefully, those are like GMT times or something. That's not the time here, but um, but yeah, some some data in there. If we do count uh, star in there, I might imagine. Yeah, this goes down, right? Uh, because we haven't pulled in any new data yet, and that fifteen minute uh, threshold is sort of marching forward as uh, as time goes on. And uh, you know, you do. Count star if you want, but you can also put a whole bunch of other cool queries downstream from that. Uh, so if you wanted that to feed into your various dashboards, you wouldn't have to just count things. You could also do any of, uh, for example, <laughs> our top K uh, games being played. Uh, we could totally actually. Why don't we? Why don't we? This is probably a giant mistake, but uh, <laughs> we we could try putting this in, and instead of using the uh, that sort of boring source of data. Um, Actually, is this going to be aggregated the right way? This isn't. Sorry, this isn't aggregated the right way. Let me let me not not get myself into trouble. Um, anyway, I guess this here's a, this is a query that's meant to show off the fact that uh, as we watch this, this probably advances. Yeah. So, of the things in about 15 minutes, which is something that we're working on maintaining for you, if you go and look at the min, that ends up being uh, it marches forward. As we throw data away, um, yeah, I don't know. So, so there's some more cool queries. Um, some of them have uh, exciting points. I think this this next one, for example, is going to show us how to do a, a join. Uh, this is a join between the Kafka topics, so the all of those events flowing through, and also the Postgres source. Uh, right. So stream tag IDs came in from our Postgres source, and it's something that you could, if you're Twitch or someone, you could manipulate in your source of truth Postgres source ship new information about tags out to us and we could uh well, we would you know then immediately go and update all of the results there uh, as appropriate and let me just pull down oops so again, a small question from our uh, yeah. son yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, <laughs> go for it yeah please he doesn't dare to speak um um Basically, like the the question is like behind the hood, uh, how does materialize work? Is it even based, or is it um, triggered basically? That's, on it's time? a great question, and I, I the fact that I haven't answered that is a giant screw up on my part. Uh, it's it's all event based, so it's all um, actually. Let me I'll just press enter here to show the thing. Great, let's let's look at a visualization of what's going on. So if we crack open, this is uh, if you go materialize turns on a, a server at uh, mm. six eight seven five, and there's some visualizations here of uh, what's going on in materialize and it's all based on data flows where so this is our Kafka uh, source for example and it's going into uh, a data flow that's going to respond to new events that come in so events mm -hmm. that come in off of Kafka are going to be interpreted as here's a new record uh, it'll go through a variety of different uh, operations 
So you know, we have to pull out various source errors. This is the upstart operator that overwrites values by keys, do a fair bit of work, uh, and then come down into some more query stuff where we've. Uh, uh, so what we're looking at at the moment is it's kind of the what is it is the logical plan of everything like how it goes in. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a so it's. Uh, more specifically, I'd say it's a, a data flow plan of that. So it's it's a directed acyclic graph that's going to tell us when an event shows up at one of our various sources, what needs what to happen to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, what other events should it prompt? Right. So each of these edges are only going to produce output results as a function of, of new inputs. Um, and as we move them through the data flow, they get transformed in various ways, like you know, flat map takes one record and produces multiple out of it. We've got some join uh, some join work down here that's going to join together records coming in from both of the sides. Uh, but it's all it's all event driven very much so. It's you know we only do work in response to actual changes occurring in in various inputs. That's what prompts mm -hmm. the computation. It's one of the things that allows us to um, deliver sort of both high throughput and low latency like so if nothing's happening then we're like always up to date and can tell you with confidence, we've got the right answer. And the moment one thing changes, we'll do, as far as we can tell, as little work as possible to push that new one event through the data flow and get a new correct and consistent answer uh, at the other end. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And internally, it's a very different architecture than a lot of databases have. And that's one of the reasons that it's qualitatively different. Um, if, if you tried to implement this in, let's say, just in Postgres by issuing some queries, right? Like, let's say you tried to put together a query that said, how should I update the answer to my to my query? That works for some, like you can update counts pretty well. You can update mins and maxes pretty well. If, if you're adding records, if you're deleting records, it's really hard. Um, you can update joins sometimes, but things get really sticky as soon as you start doing reductions after joins, after you know, all these, these sorts of things. And materialists are sort of built, engineered, built from the ground up to handle response, handle event-driven uh, computations efficiently. But yeah, so it's, uh, it's a great question, very much uh, event driven with a, a data flow processor behind it, rather than sort of triggers and reevaluation of, of queries, yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, so that was, sorry, we sh we sh I shouldn't have just run away from that. Yeah, question because you mentioned the data flow engine yeah. behind it. it yeah. It, it's mentioned it's, it's timely data flow, right? Um, yes. Is it, uh, is it something that came before Materialize? Is it a parallel project? Yeah, yeah, yeah so that's a good point. Uh, Tell me data flow is something that I've worked on uh, for a while. So uh, as far back as, uh, let's say, 2010, 2011, or something like that at Microsoft okay. uh, Research, we were building, so Microsoft Research back, back in the days built things like Dryad Link, which was sort of a precursor to, uh, to Spark, probably more familiar with Spark, but you know, introduced the idea that you might use a uh, high-level language to build data flow graphs that could then scale out to hundreds of computers. And there's a project uh, there called called Niad, which sort of built this timely data flow framework, the abstraction that was sort of the streaming analog to the batch-oriented computations that people had had before. And that's evolved a lot. It sort of got a rewrite in Rust, uh, which which I'm a big fan of. Rust, that is. Uh, I like the rewrite also, but but. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a project that's been going on. I, I don't know. I would say for about like five years now, maybe six years. Mm -hmm. And part, yeah, part of the value of Materialize is taking that engine, that, that core, that you know, you're sort of happy to have access to that performance and expressive power, but translating it to SQL, in some sense, translating it to uh, the idioms and ways of expressing uh, oneself that most analysts are comfortable with. Versus having to hand wire together a whole bunch of like if you had in timely data flow you have to build these data flows yourself you have to write code that assembles all of these data flows for you you have to write the code inside each of these things as sort of raw Rust code and so what we're doing is putting these things together for you so that you actually get SQL the SQL experience out the other end with all of its little quirks and and funny right. corners yeah yeah very interesting it's really cool. that's a, like the data flow is really at the core of materialize and materialize. The features of materialize basically bring this uh, its capabilities to uh, to the end user. I think that's I think that's right. I mean, in terms of volume of work, like a lot of work at materialize has actually been um, making things pleasant and usable, sort of like on the SQL side, if you will, and the query optimization side, and, and less on the on the engine side. Which, you know, it is what it is. It works, but but there's a lot of work to try to make 
something usable, pleasant to use, pleasant to understand, all these sorts of things. And that's uh, most of what we've been uh, been working on there. Yeah. Cool. Maybe maybe another question, Frank. Um, yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, also, maybe something you're you're gonna touch upon, but uh, but I was but I'm wondering about like, do you have a in terms of security? Do you have within materialized like a notion on on users that can access certain views or groups that can access certain views? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm not the right person to so role based access control is is a roadmap thing. Like we're planning on doing that, but it's one of these things that's that's uh, enterprisey. Um, so if you think of uh, materialize as, as a thing that we want people to be able to try out easily and get up get up and running with. Um, that vanilla version has, I guess, the concept of users. For example, like when when you connect to materialize, you're meant to supply user ID name and, and some credentials. Uh, that defaults to being nothing in particular. <laughs> you just you know, and we'll see when we turn on metabase. Actually, it's an empty password that you that you start out with, yeah. and adding adding that in is an important part of building out sort of the enterprise solution here. Um, there is support for like um, for Kerberos in a lot of the sources. So like when you go and connect to Kafka, for example, you'll need to often provide some certs there. And you know we have things set up so that you can provide uh, provide those without just copying them in as as uh, plain text or anything like that. But um, but yeah, the so I would say more advanced. I don't know if that's the right way. To, but role based access control no, is a, a classic sort of solution that people want so that they can control who gets to see what data and all these things yeah okay but that's something then that you could basically set up on each source so let's imagine uh like uh, because i know for example it's uh, it's something that is offered offered on the uh, like i'm looking at the moment the azure sql oh. um, like you could set this up in a way that your user only gets access to the i mean that source or that specific data and then if they do something in materialized it's propagated somewhat that that would be nice. I, just to be totally clear, Michelle does doesn't do this at the moment. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. But yeah, okay. yeah. But it makes a lot of sense. And in particular, systems like like materialized that are based on views mm -hmm. uh, are really good for, uh, in my mind, really good for access control. But for, for exactly that reason, right? Rather than say, oh, you're not able to access this part of the data mm. in some table. I mean, that's a little hard to explain necessarily what you're allowed to touch. But telling someone, you know, you're allowed to look at this view that I've created over my data where I've filtered out records I don't want you to see. But then it's it's a pretty easier contract uh, at that point to say, um, yeah, you just you get access to that view. You don't get access to the raw data because why would you? You know, you weren't given that that permission. Mm -hmm. But someone else can step in and do write as logic the access control essentially say that you cannot see records that you know do not match some some predicate. You know, your right. group has to equal the group associated with the uh, the record or stuff like that. But I, I should also be super clear that like I, I'm not the uh, materialist expert on access control and the correct ADM. So hopefully, the person of materialist who is isn't currently you know uh, head and hands about what I'm accidentally promising or something like that. So this is all <laughs> subject to be totally wrong. Um, but uh, no, no, but that's scary. That's that's. Uh, yeah. It's a topic that uh, where we have to wait for more information, basically. I, th I think that's right. Happen. Yeah, I think that's right. It's one of these things that um, we absolutely want to do, though. It's it needs you know we want to do it as part of the. Uh, I mean, so at some point, materialize the company wants to make enough money to pay its employees, th things like that, right? And finding the people who want these enterprise level features, making sure that they're well supported, well documented, well spec'd out, and, all, and standards compliant and stuff like that is going to be part of that, and you know. May or may not be as interesting for just the casual user who wants to try something out on their laptop, but will be absolutely critical for people who need, I don't know, like LTAP integration or mm -hmm. various other, you know, things like that, that that we can totally, we will totally end up building for people, um, for, for classes of people. But, but uh, you know, anyhow, um, I'm, I'm bluffing about a bunch of this, but. <laughs> no, no, okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe another topic, uh, infrastructure-wise. Like, if of course now we're now very much in a in a demo setup. But let's say if you want to deploy this at scale, like, uh, how would you go about this, or is it, is there is there a proposed way to do it? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, materials at the moment, the, the thing that you can get and use uh, most easily is a binary. It's not a uh, at the moment not a scale out piece of technology. Mm -hmm. um, the underlying engine is so timely data flow uh, underneath all of this. Does scale out to multiple uh, workers, but we're 
only carefully turning that on just because there's a lot of questions it raises. Like timely data flow, for example, does this just by opening some ports and <laughs> sending binary data into the ports. And this is clearly not a grown up way to, to do things. You don't want to deploy into someone's uh, infrastructure with a thing that has a lot of ports open and it's just going to randomly yeah. execute code. So there's some questions about how do we do this in the most grown up way, sort of allow people to turn on uh, scale out versions of materialize that um, uh, you know, aren't likely to tie their shoelaces together in the first five minutes, aren't likely to end up being a, you know, a CVE every day explaining why, uh, why we stole all your data or something like that. Um, so you know, trying to do that very, very carefully, both from a security and manageability point of view. Um, so at the moment, yeah, what people have been doing is just deploying uh, single box instances of materialize that internally scale out to the number of cores that they have. And th the thing that's been nice, and uh, it's sort of a different take on how to handle big data. Um, the timely data flow system was built a little bit in response to Spark like systems that said, go get a thousand CPUs, that'll be good enough. And could do the same work on 10 CPUs uh, or 10 cores in one CPU, uh, which Sounds a bit uh, alarming to hear someone say that, but you know, a lot of there's a lot of inherent inefficiency in a lot of the big data systems, and timely data flow is meant to squeeze out a lot of that. One example is timely data flow is really good at maintaining state for you as as data change. You don't need to go and reread all sorts of data every time you rerun an operator, which is sort of part of how Spark was built. Um, so we find. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 but I was going to ask, like, uh, to that, like, because you, so you just mentioned kind of this scaling, uh, like, how far can you push <laughs> materialize, basically? Yeah. Like, what's the, what's the limit? What's the performance? Uh... I mean, we've, we've been running it um, in, what, like, uh, test, I don't know, that's right, but like, you know, 64 to 128 core type systems. Um, it works great on, like, on my laptop, I use, Four cores, I don't know. Um, and it scales out nicely. Th there's some engineering questions to try to figure out, like, have we really nailed perfect scaling all the way out to that limit? Because various exciting things become bottlenecks. Like the operating system itself becomes a bottleneck uh, at some point. Um, but in, in terms of data, like, uh, how much? Yeah, it depends a lot on what you do. The numbers can sound really good if you are just doing a count star. Of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, this is part of the problem is that like nice. you know, nice. millions nice. of records a second. Yes, mm -hmm. you just want to count star. Absolutely no problem. Um, if you want to do some of the things where you know later on the demo, like you want to do a lateral, uh, a lateral join to pick out top k, you know things from okay, things are getting a little more complicated now because we're having to maintain copies of data for you. Sure. Uh, and the numbers change around a little bit. So it, it it's a little hard. We haven't really nailed how do you actually go and measure uh, these these sorts of systems. In, in part because it does depend on what you're trying to do with it. And if, if you just want to count, if you want some simple sums, these things are plenty fast. And as you start to do some of the harder things, and to be honest, that's sort of why people show up at materials because they want to do some of the harder things. They mm -hmm. know how to do a, a count to keep a count up to date. Um, but if they want to start doing a five-way join, uh, you know, we, the answers to those questions start to be a bit more like, well, what's what's the cardinality of each of your relations? What's you know how selective are our various things? And it's a little hard to nail down. You know, for some cases, yeah, sure, still a million records a second, if nothing too exciting is happening in the course of a join. But if you're doing like triangle counting or some you know exotic thing like that that blows up the cardinality of the intermediate results, then we you know we won't get any rid of that number anymore. Okay. That's not a great answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> like the answer is sort of, I don't know, it depends. You gotta try it. Uh, and we'd love to get ourselves in a state where we have clearer answers to that. Uh, but there aren't there aren't really a lot of good established benchmarks yet that I'm aware of for streaming computations. Mm -hmm. No, no, okay. okay. Yeah. And and there there is like you, like you have the ability to save a copy of the data. Like is this is this persistent or is it or is it just? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is changing. Uh, the answer as of now is no. Uh, <laughs> so the answer as of now is is your source is either persistent or not. So yeah. you know, Kafka keeps your data until you tell it to throw it away. Postgres keeps your data until you tell it to throw away. Uh, if you turn materialize off and then on again, we will go and pull back again from Postgres and from Kafka. Okay. Um, and that's you know a, a operational choice that we've made for the moment. We're going to be changing that going forward because uh, we thought initially this was a great idea, right? Like everyone loves Kafka. Uh, that's where they want to keep all their data. 
and more and more people have come to us and said, you know, it'd really be great if you kept my data rather than Kafka. Um, right. It's yeah. just, or, you know, having having to use five bits of technology to do one thing is less exciting than using one piece of technology to do that. So uh, if, if for no other reason than the fact that we have these tables internally that we need to keep persistent, uh, we're going to start to exercise our persistence, sort of flex our, our persistence muscles and make sure that we uh, do a good job writing things down in a way that, um, well, here's the, the exciting thing, I guess, is that we've discussed already two technologies, Kafka and Postgres. Mm -hmm. And Kafka is really good at presenting a log. It tells you what's changed. Yeah. But if you want to know, all right, well, how about the current value of any one particular thing? Yeah, it's not as good as that. Uh, it's just the log doesn't, doesn't reflect that. Same time, Postgres is really good at maintaining indexed representations of things. This is how it stores all of its tables. And it's really good at telling you you know, what's the current value of some you know, some particular record with some some key, but you know a little less good at uh, pushing along notifications as things change. This is essentially the the replication log that we're we're tapping into. So we want to be good at both of these things. We want to put together a persistent representation that's both good at random access as appropriate, and also uses an event uh, driven uh, communication. Uh, Framework essentially tells us when things have changed, what exactly has changed, that type of thing. So, the off-the-shelf tools for this aren't great, uh, and we're sort of rolling around at the moment to see to see how that goes. But, but soon enough, I would say persistent. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sweet. All right. There's there's one or two more things uh, to, to sort of see in the in the demo. Um, um, we saw our, our Postgres join type thing. Uh, if, you know, if, if you're familiar with what the contents of the Postgres table mean about these tags, those results would be uh, would be clarifying to us. I'm not actually sure uh, what they're representing. They're sort of you can think of tags having parent classes and you know doing some aggregation down to the parent classes, stuff like that. Okay. But there's um, another mm -hmm. query here. Uh, I think this is really cool, though. It really my experience has been I do a bad job explaining it. Uh, but <laughs> there's uh, some cool things that you could. This is like a, a top K, uh, top K view. Let's just go and create it um, for kicks. Uh, this is standard SQL, though. It, it, sorry, all of these are going to be standard SQL, but this is very standard SQL of uh, selecting some stuff out, ordering by a thing, and limiting to sure. top ten viewers by counts. You can do, I think, some really cool stuff though. Actually, just using straight SQL, though it's a little sneaky, um, where we use uh, a lateral join mm -hmm. and. I I didn't know what lateral joins were until uh, we're getting materialized. But these are really cool joins that allow you to, uh, in the body of the lateral join, reference columns that are available in other parts of the pre preceding relations in the join. So we have up here a vStream game top 10 with, uh, it's called T. Mm -hmm. And down in the lateral join, we can actually reference columns of T. Mm -hmm. So we can pull out, in this case, we're saying, hey, just pull out the um, the top ten those those uh, game ideas that we had up there in the top ten game ideas, and what this is doing is is going and populating the results of the query by a much more complicated SQL query, only executed on those top ten records. This is pulling out the um, essentially the usernames uh, of who, who are the the witnesses to those top ten uh, those top ten things. Why are they top ten? Tell me about the username, the game name, stuff like that. That is a little harder to pull out in just a count. Like we know how to do a group by count. It's a little harder to pull out, you know, group by uh, show me the best record in that group. Sure. Right. Yeah. And that's essentially what's going on using this lateral join. We've written a, a top K style idiom, in this case one, but uh, top K. And you know, we could change that to be three or something if we wanted. But uh, this now shows us if we uh, Uh, not only the top games that are being played at the moment, but also the uh, folks from that who have the, uh, the highest viewer counts. Something that would be a little tricky to pull out um, otherwise. And what I really like about little joints is that you can make this inner query as complicated as you like. And uh, we're only going to end up doing work based on the input table that drives it. Mm -hmm. So one way to think about this is this vstream game top 10, it could be whatever. It could be your own private table if you wanted. But the records that you add to and delete from this relation here 
will determine what subsets of records we execute this query on. One way to think about it uh, is my, it's either work or it won't, uh, is this is a lot like a streaming prepared statement, right? So this, this query here is a lot like a prepared statement where T game ID is a blank. Like, we don't know what that is. We want to turn on uh, this prepared statement where the bindings to this are hydrated by a stream, right? The bindings are going to be whatever bindings you drop into this input relation. We'll go and compute the answers to this query, tag them with the binding that you supplied, and produce and maintain all of them. So, you know, if you wanted to have, uh, you know, 100 prepared statements, you're running concurrently with different bindings. The lateral join pattern is a great way to do that without having to bounce up into prepared statement land, which often sort of varies based on the system that you're using. Yeah. So, so this link makes it very efficient to do these types. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So, not only like a prepared statement, for example, you often the work that you can do in a prepared statement is you pre-do some of the parsing, maybe a little bit of the optimization, that type of thing. With this lateral join version of a, of a prepared statement, we're actually going and reusing data assets. Like we're, we're, you know, this join that we're going to do is going to join the Twitch stream TS. We're going to put that into an indexed form uh, that's going to be shared by all of the instances of that prepared statement. So we're actually sharing computation and a bit of state across all these queries as well, which is kind of cool. It doesn't, doesn't make nearly as much sense in a prepared statement world where when you press enter, you want to see the result and then it's done. Right? Part, of the, part of the contract is you're doing a prepared statement and you want to watch the results. And it gives us permission to go and share some computation between, you know, if you have 100 of these at the same time, it makes a lot of sense to share the state and computation among them. And writing it this way gives us clearer permission than if you just pressed enter 100 times really fast. Okay. Yeah. Submit the base. <laughs> so, so, so the yeah the rest of the demo the, the, the sort of winding down <clears throat> part of it is uh, just going through metabase and sort of confirming essentially that that uh, materialize plays nice with with metabase. Let, let's just sort of drop over there. I have uh, metabase model set up. I have to type a few things into here. Um, I don't even. Um, And I forget if we even need to do this. Um, let's put the random stuff in here. Um, this is, sorry, this is the metabase wanting to stay in touch with me, uh, which <laughs> is adorable. Um, we're using uh, a fork of metabase that knows about materialize at the moment, though you can also use Postgres and just and get slightly um, uh, less delightful interactions. Okay. So the, the Postgres connector could connect to uh, Materialize already. Yeah, though I want to I want to caveat that a little bit. Like, the, there's a long tail to features in PGWire um, and all of the ways that it reports various catalogs. This is and that's so whatnot. Okay. Metabase is very interested about using those, and not 100% of them are implemented in, in Materialize yet. So like some things sort of grossly fail if you tell it it's Postgres, and we're patching those as as we find them. But um, one of the slightly easier ways to, to do things was just to say, like, when you want to see the catalog contents, here's the actual command you can issue uh, okay. um, instead of slash D or something like that. <laughs> All right, we're just going to put in the standard, um, standard materialized stuff. Oh, password there. Um, oh, yeah, sure. This looks good. Token does not match the setup token. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see if I could, this was not a problem previously. Uh, do any of you folks? Uh, this is the curse of the demo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I literally have no idea uh, what this means. Yeah. We can, um, let's instead, uh, so to be totally honest, I'm not great at driving meta, uh, MetaBase around. No, so, but uh, but I think this, so. What MetaBase allows you to do is to to connect to this and to basically show visualizations on top of this. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how? Um, because one of the, but the part of the selling point is, of course, the real time aspect. Can, can yeah. MetaBase do this? So, so that's a great question. Bullet number eight here is MetaBase will default to doing I think one once a minute refreshes. Oh, okay, I see the refreshes one there. Yeah. And you can drive it down to use it using uh, the sort of modifier, the hash refresh equals one, drive it down to once a second refreshes. OK, so it really gives you basically a more or less uh, real time dashboard. Yeah, yeah, we could go lower, except if, if you type in 0 0.1 there, MetaBase doesn't go down to 10 times a second. It just stays at one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit, 
I mean, it's not insane. Metabase almost certainly thinks it's being pointed at Snowflake or Postgres or something like that, where reissuing you know, the 100 queries it needs to issue is expensive. Uh, and it, you'd get someone really upset if you allowed them to type in 0 0.01 there. <laughs> exactly, but, yeah. But yeah, if, if these things are materialized, then for materialized to return the answers back is just, you know, it reads them out of its materialization and hands them back and it's done in a few milliseconds, something like that. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, much higher potential uh, throughput and lower latencies when you're back here with materialized, but you sort of can understand why Metabase wants to be a little careful about not letting people uh, accidentally wedge wedge the database they're pointed at. Yeah. So this is this is a just a just a GIF, but it's it's something that Marta put together that is a dashboard in Metabase that's going to look at some of these results. You can sort of see the you know, the top ten games type stuff, the streamers. Uh, in principle, this is the type of dashboard. You know, if, if you were at Twitch wanting to track, you know, the health of, make sure that everyone's doing a good job streaming and and seeing what's going on. The sort of dashboard you might imagine putting together uh, using just just SQL instead of a whole bunch of bespoke tools, right. which is sort of cool. Okay. Maybe uh, I'm also looking a bit at the time. We're a bit over time. A uh, uh, last question I'm uh, thinking about because we're now like we're using Metabase to connect to to materialize. Like uh, if we take the like the example of Postgres for example, like it's typically challenging. Like if you have a lot of connections to Postgres and you do set up a pool and stuff like this. Like, are there any limitations for materialize at this moment? Like the number of connections to materialize stuff like this. Not not baked in. I mean, we will continue to accept. All sorts of connections. Um, the no, generally not. I mean, the, the main sorts of limitations, I guess, are you know, whereas Postgres might have put some limitations in place to try to make sure that you don't screw up anyone else's experience. Mm -hmm. Materialize is happy to allow hundred people to connect and get in each other's way. <laughs> so, like, if if Metabase is, is connected uh, and issuing all sorts of refresh queries and is keeping Materialize at you know, eighty percent CPU or something like that, mm -hmm. then if you log in on the side through another session. And start trying to do some heavy lifting or something like that. Um, yeah, you know, the two of you will fight for compute resources. Um, but but there's no there's no hard limit to. Uh, okay. I, mean, I think there's 32-bit identifiers we use somewhere because that's how PGWire works. Yeah. So like no no more than four billion. Um, but something else will go wrong long before that. But but it's not baked in as a hard limit. No. Okay. Okay. All right. And there's um, things like I would say, like Postgres replication slots, for example, are an expensive resource, and they sort of warn you against using too many of these. I, I'm not sure that there's an analogous thing for materialize. Um, so throughout the system, we've done a pretty good job, I think, of trying to make sure that these resources are as lean as they need to be. So if you wanted to stream data back, I, th I think I didn't show you as a um, materialize is a cursor support, so you can uh, pull essentially th through something like PSQL pull. Uh, a changing relation and we'll get a live stream coming back at you, okay. telling you at what times did things change. Why, and it's sort of the tool you might want to use if you're going to build an app that spoke directly to uh, materialize rather than repolling once a once a second or something like that. And this is handy for lowering the data volumes even more. Um, but throughout the system, we really tried to do this to make it so that we only keep state and do work when there's something worth talking about. And if nothing's happening. Pretty idle, you know. We don't uh, we don't have using a lot of resources, so we can turn on a thousand connections, and if they're all working, absolutely, things will get hairy, probably start to fall over. But if a lot of them are idle at the moment or not much is changing, uh, it's not intrinsically problematic. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um... Yeah. So this is it. This is this is the end of the demo. Uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna fight Metabase. I'm gonna lose. I think. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Let, let's uh, round this up. Um, we're also a bit over time. Uh, what is the best way to for people to uh, keep up to speed on uh, what Materialize is doing, where they're heading? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I mean, a great place to go is to the Materialize homepage, just as you know, materialize.com. And there's a bunch of contact points here, depending on what you're interested in. So if you want to read about what's doing, uh, there's you know, grab the white paper. If you want to sign up for uh, information about Materialize Cloud, which is currently in in beta, uh, it's a great place to sign up. You know, that sort of reaching out to folks at Materialize will keep you in touch. Um, you know, we do regular releases and announce them on Twitter, stuff like that. So you can follow Materialize on Twitter. It's Materialize at, at Materialize Inc. Um, and you know, just sort of wandering around in the docs. There's some information on the homepage about how to uh, join the community, how to hit the community Slack, for example, where it's a great place to sort of chat about like how do I do X, Y, and Z, or you know, occasionally W doesn't work. Is that right or wrong? And absolutely, you know, we're still fixing things, lots of things in Materialize. So it's a great place to. 
do a sanity check and make sure that uh, uh, you've got things figured out and we, we, we've got to fix something. But right. And because you just mentioned, like one one last question that I have is uh, like the what's the cloud version? Like, what do you gain yeah. from a uh, cloud? Yeah. So the main thing that the cloud stuff offers at the moment is operational simplicity. Um, yeah. There's it's going to be evolving going forward in the future, but at the moment, this is mostly you know, if life would be annoying and hard for you, turning on materialize, keeping it running, um, mm -hmm. doing various sort of dashboards into its, into its performance, we're happy to set you up with that. Uh, okay. And uh, the direction that this is heading, to be, to be totally candid, is, is sort of a bit more enterprise scale -y type uh, mm -hmm. cloud deployments right. where, you know, we can turn on multiple instances, talk with uh, consistent mm -hmm. sources of data across multiple materialized instances so that your org can scale out its use cases, not just in terms of like scaling one use case across multiple computers, but if you have different groups in your in your firm that want their own, either their own piles of data to work with or their own isolated compute instances, um, that's the sort of thing that you would you would find in cloud that that isn't going to be quite as easy if you just don't go and download the uh, the source. Okay, clear. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Frank. For a very uh, interesting session. Yeah, uh, no, no to see where uh, materialized will go in the coming time. Yeah, well, I'm, me too. <laughs> <Super interested. laughs> also, I know it's it's really fun. I mean, it's it's one of these things where um, if it were I don't know a twenty percent better database, I, that that's fine. Like that's interesting uh, work to do. But I, it really does seem like it has the potential in some dimensions to be orders of magnitude better. Almost certainly worse in some of the dimensions. I don't want to pretend that we're there's magic. But there's a whole lot of really cool stuff to investigate that like, wow, we can do this thing so much better than anyone else could. How who let's go find the people that that's gonna delight and uh yeah, so a super uh, interesting yeah. problem to uh, to solve. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Frank. Yeah, uh, of course. Thanks a lot to all our listeners and viewers, and we will uh, see you all during the next tour tools. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thanks very much for